Today's guest is Asaf Elia Shalev. Asaf Elia Shalev is an Israeli-American journalist with Mizrahi Rus. Based in Los Angeles, he works as an investigative reporter for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. He was a historian behind the 2022 re-release of the Israeli Black Panthers Haggadah. He recently published a narrative nonfiction book titled Israel's Black Panthers, The Radicals Who Punctured a Nation's Founding Myth. Welcome, Asaf. So happy to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, there's so many questions I want to ask you about your latest book that just came out, um, which I just finished reading. Um, but first, I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about the process of writing this book and how you actually got to writing this book. Um, well, I, I wrote it while also uh, doing a million other things, such as making a living in different jobs. I moved countries several times. I moved to different cities. I got married. I had two kids. So it was a, a prolonged process. Um, and it started from a chance encounter I had with uh, Reuven Aberzel, one of the founders of the Panthers, many, many years ago. And we sat down for interviews, and I had no idea um, that I'd be writing a book. I, I you know, maybe I had some idea, but but it was a, just a general thing that I felt like I needed to do. And, and he was very into the idea. Um, and over time, as I developed as a journalist and realized that no one had told the story of the Black Panthers in full, and not, not, not in this way, at least, there, there had been kind of portrayals in theater or, or you know, but not, not in this way. Um, I, I decided to, to do more than go beyond the interviews with Ruven and uh, to interview everyone I, possibly, I could possibly find and hit the archives and collect news coverage from the time. Um, and do uh, you want me to talk about, uh, do you want to say more about that or? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely the research is very extensive and I, I want to hear more about that. Um, but I guess I also want to hear how you first met Hoven and like what your connection, right? Because it's also feel, I mean, even as you are writing this as a historian, as a researcher, as all these things, it's also a, in some ways a personal story. Yeah. Um, so I uh, grew up in the United States, but also I spent a big chunk of my childhood in Israel. Um, I come from an Iraqi and Bulgarian family, um, one side and the other. And uh, I went to college at UC Berkeley. Um, and there I, uh, you know, got a little bit into activism. And I, uh, and I was also learning about the American Black Panthers. I wrote I wrote my biggest paper in college about the American Black Panthers. I chanced upon a reference on the internet to the Israeli Black Panthers. And it said something about, on Wikipedia, it said something about they they represented the struggle of, of Mizrahi Jews. And I said, wait, that's isn't that my family? What is this all about? This is a little weird. I want to know more. Um, but there was almost like no information uh, online about the American Black Panthers at the time, certainly not in English or no information about the Israeli Black Panthers, certainly not in English. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was like, I had a, a lot of friends who were Arab on, on campus from Syria and Iraq and, 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 and the West Bank and, and all kinds of places. And, um, you know, when, when it came up that I was like, I had the Iraqi heritage, they, they would do this thing where like, they take your glasses off. Oh, you're Asaf. You're one of us. And I looked more Arab, I guess, with my glasses off. Um, and so uh, that helped me realize that there's something significant here to my heritage, that I'm not just like another Amer Ashkenazi American Jew. And, and I wanted to lean into figuring out what that means and like learning more about my family's experience in Israel. Um, I also remembered like as a kid, uh, in Israel, one of the first questions you ask when you meet someone is like, what is your motza? What is your like ethnic background? And at least growing up, that's what it was like. I don't know if it's like that today still. I imagine so. Um, and I remember as a kid, I'd always say Bulgarian first or, or just Bulgarian. Like, why? Why was I doing it? Like, what less did I internalize it? Like, it was preferable to be Bulgarian than Iraqi? Like, something something was going on for me to have done that um, as a kid. Which is interesting because, you know, I had the same experience. Yeah. Not that I have any like Ashkenazi or 
but I actually pretended I was Ashkenazi because I didn't want people yeah. to know I was like I thought I could hide it. You yeah. Know? And uh, and so I, as a twenty three or twenty four year old, I moved to Israel. So after college, great recession is happening. So. Uh, I got a job as a news editor at Haaretz. I was very lucky to get a job like that um, in the economy that uh, that we had at the time. And, um, you know, and, and I happened to meet Ruven at a party. But bef I, And I'd met him before. Like a year earlier, I went to Israel on this trip. I took a tour of Musrara that uh, was led by Ruven. And he was telling his the story of the Panthers. And I was just like shocked that someone could even talk this way. Like he was saying stuff I hadn't seen anywhere else. He was speaking with like a fire and a passion and, and sense of urgency, the 70 year old man at the time. Um, and uh, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I'd recently read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I was like, oh, this guy sounds like the Israeli Malcolm X. Um so it left a big impression that was, and I come to Israel, work to work for arts a month into my moving to Israel. Um, a friend invites me to like a party. Uh, it turns out it was at a, at a bar frequented by the people that were doing the tent protest, the Rothschild like tent protest in Israel at the time. So like a lot of activists were there and Ruven was there and we talked and um, I told him I'm this like American, Israeli, I speak Hebrew, I speak English, I write in English. Um, I'm Mizrahi. I want to know more about the Panthers. And he's like, let's let's sit down and talk. Like, I, I want the story to come out in English. And at some point in our conversations, he kind of described his feeling, um, his whole his whole life as as being stuck in prison. Like talking to me felt like smuggling a letter out of prison. He felt like the his lack of English kept his story from from getting out. And um, so it was important for him to share through me uh, with the world. Um, and we ended up doing this, you know, just like he had given a tour that I went on now. Um, he was doing tours and uh, I was interpreting for an English speaking uh, crowd. So every week for like two years, I went to Musa and walked with him on the, on the little pathways in Musa and, and had groups that we would tell the story to. And I learned how to speak um, he was speaking through me, like I'm having to take what he's saying. And he speaks philosophically and he speaks at, a, at, at different, not only that he speaks at a very high register of Hebrew, but he also switches a lot because he, he's, for someone who didn't go to school beyond third grade, like his abilities are just insane. His verbal and intellectual abilities are just off the charts. And I had to live, like put it into English. And so I got a little bit better every time. Um, and I really internalized his voice. And so that, that became very, uh, very helpful later on when I had to write him as a character in my book. Um, right. It's a like complete fact-based, but, but I'm writing it as a work of narrative nonfiction. So woven as a character and there's scenes and there's a plot. And so, yeah. um, that's kind of how we got to the, to the book. Yeah. So that, it seems like that relationship with woven really, I mean, this research for the book you said take took over like 10 years to really have the conversation interview the people go into the archives you know and, and translate it um into the larger international world and you know one thing i wanted to also just acknowledge that at the end of the book you mention how um, five of the people that you interviewed for this book have now passed away and i think actually now it's six Mm -hmm. when, and the time between when the book uh, was completed and it was published, Charlie Beaton died. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you about, you know, you said Ruben spoke with a sense of urgency, which is a certain urgency that is familiar to me and I feel as well, too. But um, given that, you know, a significant number of the people you interviewed have passed, like, how do you hold this creation now um, in terms of like telling the story um, and, and maybe also in relationship with that, like why do you think there hasn't been more written about the Black Panthers, the Israeli Black Panthers in English? Can you explain the first part of the question again? 
Well, just, I mean, I, I guess I will share for me personally, you know, I think we're at this time where it's, it's definitely in the Mizrahi community, like a lot of our elders are dying. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the um, the people who either knew a time pre-48 or, you know, were part of the activism on the ground, um, like the Black Panthers in Jerusalem um, and their stories, right? There, there's kind of a lack of honoring of their stories and lack of documentation and I think you know that's part of been for me I've been wanting to like fill that role of being like well how do we actually remember our lineage and not just let it be distorted by powers that be and you know to me I feel like um there's a similarity there so I guess I wanted to hear how like how you relate to that to that you know the people that you are interviewing and in this you know very monumental work in some ways that they're also dying at this time you know yeah i mean it was their story is so remarkable and all these people i interviewed are so remarkable they came from nothing and they burst into the world with like this creative energy um and helped shape like mizrahi culture and the larger israeli culture in all kinds of profound ways um, and I think it's a shame that like not more people get to experience these people. And so it's like just an honor to be able to chronicle their story. Um, it's, it's incredible. It was incredibly hard to do, um, getting basic facts, um, about the Panthers was, it took a lot, a lot, a lot of digging and cross checking many, many different sources and, there's some things where I still didn't know for sure uh, what had happened. Um, so I think, you know, it's, I don't know exactly how this book is going to be used and by whom, but I, but I'm, I felt it was like my duty ultimately to like, to do right by the story and, and to, uh, to tell, to like document for posterity, what exactly had happened. Um, and it, I did think throughout the process, uh, I, as I go into like an archive and I pull some file on the Panthers, like why had no one else asked for this file before? Because that that happened multiple times. Um, there has been there has been some research. Um, there's some journalists who who've published you know exposés and and different things about the Panthers over the years. There's a few academics who've done work. There was an ethnographer who was a uh, getting her PhD in sociology and she followed the Panthers and wrote a dissertation that is actually hard, kind of hard to access. Um, so there's that. Sami Shalom Shitri did, did pioneering work on the Israeli uh, Mizrahi struggle with a chapter on the Panthers. Um, but uh, no one had really full, told the story in full. And, and uh, part of that is Israeli academia in general has a blind spot about Mizrahim. So uh something in in, in journalism like it, i remember working at haaretz at the time and, and a very liberal paper in israel and there were probably more voices of palestinians in the paper than were than there were of mizrahim and, and nothing against like having palestinian voices but like um it's funny like the, it was like I, most ashkenazi and then a lot of palestinians and like very very few mizrahim even though they're they're the the bigger group in Israel, um, and uh, and I think something I noticed that it was happening in academia. A lot of people were interested in theorizing about the role the Panthers played. Uh, so they're having these like intellectual debates and academic debates where were they a a class struggle or were they a, a racial struggle or or you know, were they, you know, truly communist or like all these like terms and how they fit with them. And OK, you know, uh, I read all the I read all the articles and I learned a lot. But um, why did no one interview like this person that interview? Why, why did no one pull back the, the file? Like, I think sometimes um, people doing scholarly work feel like they can substitute like the 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 archival and interview work with just intellectual exercises. And I, I think that's like a mistake of, that's a mistake that for the larger field of academia. Yeah.
So, okay, let's get into it. Um, who were the Black Panthers? And, you know, I, I think it's also, I'm excited to just have this conversation because I'm from Jerusalem and I actually spent a number of years in Oakland. And I think the American Black Panthers definitely inspired my understanding of racial justice. But I don't know if I even told you this, but um, my parents, you know, they both grew up in Jerusalem around the time, and they were in high school around the time of um, the Black Panthers. And they always very much connected. I mean, my dad would always say he was like more of a nerd and a shy guy, so he wasn't fully involved, but he was always like, we were always supporting from afar. Um, so I also actually kind of did grow up a bit with some of the Panther narrative from home, but um, yeah, I'm really also curious, right, to, to also have this conversation about like between Jerusalem and Oakland and racial justice. So why don't you just start by telling us who were- Well, I want, I want to start with, uh with a really interesting parallel between the American and the Black, the American Panthers and the Israeli ones, one that's not obvious, that took a while for me to, to realize and discover. Um, but the founders of the American group, the original group, is Huey Newton. And the founder of the um, Israeli group, you know, in the moments before Reuven entered the scene and also became a founder, like the very first person, was Saadia Marziano. Both of them were young men who had gotten into a lot of trouble throughout their life and found themselves as at around age 20, not even knowing how to read and write. Um, both of them got radicalized by through literacy, by learning how to read and write. And I thought that's an amazing thing, the power of, of knowledge. Um, and the other pair, another thing that's very common to their biography is Hugh and Newton, their fa his family, um, came to Oakland as part of the great migration of Black Americans from the South to the North, to the cities of the North and the West. Right, that's a huge demographic pattern that that shapes a lot of what the United States is today. Um, Sadi Montiano is also the product product of a historic uh, migration, a migration of Jews from Arab countries in mass to Israel. I mean, they went to other countries too, but the biggest number of them. Uh, went to Israel. And so they both are these individuals who are like thrust by history into the lowest level, lowest rungs of society and um, find their way out of that through this embrace of knowledge and this like burning anger about what had happened to their community and a strong desire to do something about it. So, um, the emergence of the Panthers owes a lot to like this personality, this unique and powerful personality that is Sadia Marziano, um, who is the, the leader of this group of friends in Jerusalem. So you have Jerusalem at the time and throughout Israel, you have thousands of young men with no prospects in life. They're not in the military and they're not working. Um, and they organize into street gangs. Right, the the and, and this is a male phenomenon, right? The the girls are more likely to be at home. Uh, they are are more beholden to their parents' expectations. Um, the young men, for wider social reasons, are kind of more likely to have gone to juvenile delinquency uh, to institutions for juvenile delinquents to find themselves on the street to 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 cast out of like the family home, um, and. And so Israel has this like street gang problem on its hands. Um, Which is largely Mizrahi. Yeah, oh, 100% Mizrahi, right? Um, but the Panthers didn't start in Tel Aviv or Haifa or, you know, or Bishon Etzion or, or Rent Semen. They start in Jerusalem and not just in any place in Jerusalem in the neighborhood of Musara. So we have this like sociological phenomenon of the street gangs. We have the, the un, unparalleled kind of personal force of Saadi Marziano. And we also have the circumstances that are very particular to that neighborhood. Um, everyone in Musa, who all, all the all the people who grew up there at the time, lived through the fifties and sixties, where it was a war zone. Um, Musa was in the very heart of Jerusalem, uh, where it was divided between Jordanian East Jerusalem and Israeli West Jerusalem. They had barbed wire fences running through the neighborhood. They had um, these barricades against like the, the advance of tanks if, if there was ever uh, an invasion. And there were uh, Jordanian and Israeli snipers 
uh, positioned on, on opposite side from each other and they're like living below. And sometimes like they get shot, uh, shot at. Um, and there was like this tense state of war for years and years and years. And they actually, a lot of the Panthers were living in no man's land. It officially belonged to no one. And Israeli um, services didn't, didn't go into those areas. So uh, for many of them, the only interaction they had with the Israeli state was like the police that would like come to chase after, after them into the neighborhood. If like they thought if they were caught stealing something or something like that, um, but maybe no schooling, you know, at some point, social workers start arriving, very interesting Mizrahi social workers who have a huge uh, role to play. But um, but Musala, right, is this like Jerusalem's the backwaters at the time, and Musala is like the backwaters of the backwaters. And then 1967 happens, and then everything change, changes. Just like the Berlin Wall falls, and that is known as a massive moment in history, in Jerusalem, you have a different wall falling, a wall separating east and west. And Musala goes from being on the edge of the Israeli state and of Jerusalem to the very center. Um, it becomes an extremely desirable neighborhood for real estate developers, for example. Um, it is uh, adjacent to the old city. Everyone from in Israel, but all, all over the West, wants to go to the old city now. Israelis are exploring the ancient sites. Um, foreigners are arriving in mass. They are bringing... Uh, rock and roll with them. They're bringing radical politics uh, from, from certainly they're bringing imagery and stories of the American Black Panthers, but also the Tupamaros from Uruguay and, and movements that are happening in Europe. Um, so they're bringing that uh, and they're bringing that to the cafe culture of Jerusalem in, in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, Ashkenazi students from West Jerusalem actually physically walk through Musala to get to their university uh, on the other side uh, on Mount Scopus in East Jerusalem. Um, or if they want to go to the old city, they pass through Musala to buy hashish. Um, and if they're too scared to talk to Palestinians and to buy hashish, they like, they ask the Mizrahim to go buy it for them. Uh, Cause the Mizrahim had figured out a way, even when the fence was up, they'd figure out a way to make connections with Palestinians on the other side, you know, through yelling across the fence or, or, you know, tossing a ball or, or just years of like observing each other. Um, and, and slowly as the wall comes down, realizing like how many similarities they have amongst each other, language, food, culture. Um, yeah, I think actually that was my favorite chapter is around the interactions between Mizrahim and Palestinians in Jerusalem. Post if anyone wants to pay me to do a book just on that, that would be, <laughs> that I think is like the most interesting thing. It is the most interesting yeah. thing. Um, cause it spoke to, I mean, a lot of very profound insights, but one is that, you know, um, it's, there's sometimes this phrase around Mizrahim as being like imported Arabs, right? There's a local Arabs who are Palestinians and then there's like imported Arabs who are Mizrahim, but just like this interaction of being like, wait, you actually look similar to me, but what's going on here? And like trying to kind of understand these dynamics, but also feeling a sense of comfort you know, um, which I, th I think is what I got from that chapter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Um, first of all, there are, of course, Mizrahim that, that were from the area of Palestine. Yeah. Um, but just like Ruven Abergel tells, he, he grew up among Muslims in Morocco. Well, you know where Yasser Arafat grew up? Yasser Arafat grew up in the Moroccan quarter of Jerusalem, living among Jews. So... Um, that's an interesting like juxtaposition. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Actually, I have um, some of my family, my grandfather's brothers were actually friends with Arafat because yeah. of that because yeah. they grew up in the old city. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there was a moment in 2003, I believe, where Ruven um, actually travels to meet Arafat mm -hmm. when, um, when Israel was, was um, engaged in fighting with Ramallah and there was a siege. And so, um, is you know everything around the Mukata around Yasser Arafat's headquarters is like kind of being being bombed and and that wasn't that was like you know the one zone and Israelis would go like to act as human shields anyway. Uh, Uven Abelja went there and met with him and like talked to them. They talked about their childhood and they shared these stories with each other. Um, so yeah, that's really yeah really fascinating. Um, 
Okay, before we dive more deeply into the Panther story, maybe we can just share a little bit of the context of um, Mizrahi life in this newly established state of Israel, right? Because a lot of the times, and, and I think this book touches on it um, a few times, right? The sense that Zionism kind of created this uh, Jewish unity, right? So, oh, okay, like all Jews are brothers in this fight together. Um, but really, in practice and in actuality, that Jewish unity didn't translate, really, right? And we see the racial dynamic between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. Uh, but, right, there's a context to which the uh, Panthers are kind of coming through. And I think particularly, you know, you had also a whole chapter dedicated to Wadi Salib and, you know, the protests that were happening there. So. Yeah, I would love for you just I mean, provide a bit more context about that. Yeah, and, and there's a reason the subtitle of the book is uh, The Radicals Who Punctured a Nation's Founding Myth. It's exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah, so when Israel, before Israel was founded, um, if you go all the way back to Herzl, uh, political Zionism arose to solve a problem being faced by the Jews of Europe that they were horribly mistreated. Um, and the idea was we are going to uh, solve that problem by, by going to Palestine and creating a Jewish state there. And that state was explicitly supposed to be modeled on a European country. Like they wanted to establish a European looking country for European Jews in Palestine. That's what they said. That's what they all talked about. Um, that's not a controversial, uh, it shouldn't be a controversial thing. It's an historical fact today. Uh, there's a lot of discourse around that issue of like, oh, don't call it a white country, don't call it a European country. But like, that's what the, the people who founded it were talking about doing. They had a problem, though. In the early 20th century, uh, the Jews in the Soviet Union decided, you know, Russia and then, and then the Soviet Union, that whole part of Europe, they, for the most part, didn't listen to the Zionists and go to Palestine. They went to the United States. Um, Right, millions of Jews ended up in the United States, and then later on, the Holocaust uh, involved right the the absolute destruction of European Jewry. Six million Jews who maybe could have gone to Palestine were were dead now, and the and after World War II, the last kind of reservoir of Jews on the continent were behind the Iron Curtain, and Soviet Union wasn't allowing Jews to leave. So you have what six hundred thousand Jews in the in the Yeshuv pre-state. It's not enough to establish a country in the circumstances that they had, and so uh, this idea starts catching more steam of bringing the Jews from the Arab countries. Uh, there are about a million of them, and they need soldiers. They need people to work in factories, to till the fields, to build roads. Um, yeah, it's good they speak to, for the intelligence services. Um, and they need more legitimacy, right? Like they need more numbers in order to say, uh, in order to have like a demographic balance with the Palestinians. And um, and so it's the story is very different actually from, from country to country in the Middle East of, of how and why the Jews came to Israel or left. And, like I said, not all of them went to Israel, a lot went to France or to Canada and different places. But um, so I don't want to talk, you know, that's a whole other conversation about why and how the Jews left these countries and came to Israel. Um, but but a, lot, a lot of them did do that. And um, they came with a certain promise, a certain idea that was uh, that was told to them that they're coming to be brothers in the creation of a modern Jewish kingdom or a modern Jewish state. Um, it happens to be led by, by David Ben-Gurion, and who's, of course, named after King David. And Mizrahim, uh, at that time, certainly, and today, or very uh, cared very much about Jewish tradition and the symbolism of a, of a new Jewish state being led by, by David Ben-Gurion that mattered to people. Um, and they they wanted what was being promised they, uh, uh, a place to thrive as Jews to be in brotherhood with Jews from all over the world, and they come to Israel and something a little different is what they got. Um, they um, 
were treated very condescendingly by the establishment, by the Ashkenazim that were there. But I, condescension is a very important part of, of what happened um, still and still happens. But but too often in Israeli conversations, that's where it stops. Yeah. The Ashkenazim were condescending. Everyone can agree that they were condescending, right? That they they talked to them in, in, in ways that are like not so nice. Um, right, even the name Black Panthers, where why is that such an appropriate name for this group? Right. It's not, oh, they're not even black. They're they're, you know, I, I'm not black, you're not black. Um, even though we're both Mizrahim. Uh, well, Ashkenazim would call Mizrahim Shvartzechaya in Yiddish, it just it means black animal. So the Panthers were in a sense, the Israeli Panthers were reclaiming that term. Oh, oh, we're we're Shvartzechaya. No, we're black panthers. Thank you very much. Um I was also called like Shvachore, like Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> So like yeah. in the Israeli context, it was black, but like it doesn't, it, it sounds weird when you put it in American context, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so anyway, to go, to get back to where we were, so it's not just condescension, right? That's very important. There are explicit policies and practices in place that create uh, massive discrimination against Mizrahim. The, not just discrimination, the creation of a second class citizenship for Mizrahim. And that is done through every aspect of life, housing, employment, education, anything you can think of. In terms of, um, they come in, the immigrants from Europe or from the Middle East, and they're put into these transit camps. Oh yeah, I won't touch the thing, so they won't, into the transit camps. And then uh, the Europeans are quick, far more quickly transferred out into like real housing in the center of the country. Mizrahim languish in the languish in these camps for a lot longer, which are just like tent encampments, like like in the dirt. And then when they are uh, allowed to leave and like settled somewhere, very often they're settled in in the very far reaches of the country, in the margins and in the desert, places like Dimona, which were just tents on a plot of land with nothing, and and they're deposited there, and like you cannot leave. Um, and there's active measures to prevent people from leaving these like remote locales where they put them. And they're not only remote and far away from economic opportunity, they're also on the border, uh, on the borders with the Arab enemies, the Arab enemy countries. And so they are uh, exposed to uh, violence from Palestinian raiders that are coming in and attacking Israeli towns. Like who, who, who has to suffer that the most? Mizrahim. Um, anytime Egypt or Jordan or, or, or Syria um, threaten to invade, well, who's going to be the first that, that, that's going to be harmed by that? Um, which later on we see is part, um, which, you know, I think it's so interesting that you ended the, the book there with um, the relationship with the Panthers and the Likud and kind of right wing. Yeah. But, but interestingly enough, right, exactly what you're speaking to is that Mizrahim often also bear the brunt of the violence that comes to them right from Palestinian or Arab so then that kind of over time develops a certain level of like right-wing ideology. Another great example of that is what happens in the second intifada with the the bus bombings well who takes the bus yeah like who poor people take the yeah. bus at large larger all right of course I can even take the bus too but like who is overrepresented on the bus yeah um and in education, for example, they had this idea that um, Mizrahim are, are, are backwards, that they spent too much time with the Muslims and the Arabs and that they're like, their intellectual level would decrease because of it, right? <laughs> yeah, so like, so they're like, well, they won't be able to keep up with like the academic, uh, you know, knowledge. And, and so we need to wait a few generations so they can catch up. So we will give them this more simple education, which is very convenient, right? It's, it, there, it's, it's, being done in a way like to help these poor people who aren't very smart, so we have to help along. But in effect, what it says is Ashkenazim and where they live are routed to academic school to academic programs when they graduate from high school. Mizrahim are routed to vocational school. Right. So, um, you know, you could actually read it all about this. Carl Frankenstein had a whole theory about about the the uh, the rate and the pace of Mizrahi cognitive development. Um, and the education system was designed around his theories. Um, Sami Shalom Chitrit wrote about this extensively, and the Adva Center uh, was able to bear this all out in 
and statistics over the years, they actually showed that the socioeconomic status of, um, of Ashkenazim went up when the Mizrahim arrived. They went from being like the Paulim, the laborers, to being the managers. Right. And the Mizrahim went from, from a higher status. They, they were had higher income, had more education, and then they, more status, and then they come to Israel and it goes down. Right. Um, they had more of that. More in, in Casablanca and Baghdad and, and Istanbul and all these countries that were, you know, it, it, it was it was really ironic the way in which um, the founders of Israel talked about uh, talked about Mizrahim as being cave dwellers, that saying that they came from from living in caves or living in in the mountains like Baghdad and Istanbul and Casablanca and Marrakesh were like. And, and Alexandria and Cairo were far more metropolitan than Tel Aviv. Yeah. Um, so it's just a funny, uh, they just got it wrong. They, they were just completely misinformed in a way that was, that was devastating uh, about the Mizrahim that were, that they had imported to come live with them. Um, and that is, it's not only materially damaging to Mizrahim when they arrive, it's also uh, it's also psychologically yeah. very harmful because it feels like a betrayal. Like, why would you treat me this way? I thought we were Jewish brothers and sisters. Like, what happened to all that talk? Like, I was down. Yeah, uh, we were down to do it with you. Like, we were down to build this together. Like, why would you treat us that way? It doesn't make any sense. Like, Jews don't behave this way to other Jews. Um, and for some, that made some Mizrahim became very angry as a result of that. But I think the Panthers, a lot of them told me their parents, their reaction to it was to like to become like these downtrodden people, like with their their head down. And they weren't able to look up to their parents as young people because they saw them as being weak, as being as as having just just resigned to like to a lower status. Um I get emotional around this because this idea that like the loss of respect for your parents is like a very devastating feeling. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. And I can resonate with that because when you see that was actually so much of my political education is just recognizing the ways that my parents were traumatized by the state. And like, instead of just seeing them as my parents, also seeing them as individuals who have their story and what was done to them. And then, things just started making sense, you know? Um, and, and, it, and it is really hard. It's really hard to contend with. Um, certainly, I mean, what was kind of done to us as Mizrahim, but also it's like, how, how do we, you know? And, and actually, I think you talked about this a bit of like, right? And, and actually, I think this is where there's some interesting parallels with the wider Arab community because this whole sense of like honor and respect it's actually so deeply ingrained in us as people, like to be respected, to be valued. And like when there is kind of that attack on our dignity, it, it goes really deep, you know, and then the assertion of wanting to fight back um, to reclaim that. Um... And it's and it's fucked up that Mizrahim are ridiculed for caring about respect and honor, right? right like, totally. You know, like, totally. 100%. Well, easy for someone to say who hasn't ever been like, Treated in that way. <laughs> yeah, like, why, who are you people? Why do you care so much about yeah. respect? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, okay, so I want to talk about some of the, like, yeah, can you talk a little bit about Wadi Salib and, like, what was happening there? Because that, that, I think, is a really important moment in history where there was actually, like, no, we're going to fight back around this. Yeah, and the way it, it started off is is remarkably similar to how a lot of protests were in racial justice of uh, started in the United States. Uh, it, it takes place in the city of Haifa um, in northern Israel, Israel's third city, third largest city, in a neighborhood that's actually a lot a lot like Musrara in the sense that it's poor and working class and Mizrahi. It's in the neighborhood of Wadi Salib. And also like Musrara, it, it's a neighborhood that was previously populated by Palestinians until they were forced out or fled in 1948. Um, and, uh, police come in, they get reports about like a guy who was allegedly drunk or some, or disorderly in public. 
and they shoot him. They end up shooting him. Um, and, uh, you know, the neighborhood learns that, that this happened. Uh, people think he, he, he died. So he didn't die. He actually was rushed to the hospital and, and he, his life was saved. But like the neighborhood thinks he, he was killed by police. And um, then this dam breaks loose of like, the police needs to stop beating us up. They need to stop mistreating us. And, and not just the police, you know, the, the whole establishment they go and they, what do they do? Well, they target the police station, you know, throwing stuff at the police station, but they also target um, Mapai's, the Mapai party's like local headquarters because they attribute their condition to the, to the Mapai Labor Party of Israel. And um, they march and they, you know, they, they fight with police on the streets. They organize um, committees. They put out, um like manifestos um uh and this goes on for weeks and months and uh there isn't much coverage of it at the time israel has no t television in 1959 um radio is limited is is in control of the, of the government and there's not many options um and even the newspapers hardly cover this except for the communist newspaper and haolam which give it extensive coverage, but um, without mass media, you would think that maybe it would be contained to Haifa and to Wadi Salib, but no, Mizrahi networks are able to spread word of this, and there's prot protests all over the country. Um, and that's when Israel has its first reckoning about the Mizrahi Ashkenazi divide, and they have a, actually a, a, a public um, commission, an investigative investigative government commission um, to look at the issue that was raised. And actually they didn't even do that with the Panthers, right? That's the only time, you know, there's been commissions around the Yemenite affair and, and different things, but, but no bot, no government body has, um, has ever like since then before, since, made it its mission to figure out what is happening with racism in Israel. And um, I mean, they reach like conclusions that are just demonstrably false, like that it's, you know, that it shows that there's a lot of poverty among, among Mizrahim, that it shows they're able to determine that there's inequality, not very hard, but they claim that it's not due to any deliberate policy, that this is just because um, of historical circumstances about how, Zahim arrived with less resources or, or some nonsense like that. Um, and uh, it's not anyone's fault. It's not anyone's fault. It's sad and hopefully it gets better, but it's not anyone's fault. And that's what they conclude. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there's really interesting connections that I discovered between um, between Badi Salim and the agitation happening then and, and the Panthers later. Um, if you want me to talk about that, but like, so but also just I wanted to leave. Like that was one of the protests where they also like like they took the Israeli flags and dipped it in blood. Was that yeah, true? yeah, yeah. So they're on this march. I, I just I mean, that's such a powerful. Image. It's a powerful image. Um, there's probably more to be done. I mean, it's actually Vadi Sleep in some ways is like very well documented um, in a way that the Panthers. There's a lot of contentions about that, what actually happened, but. Yes, they go on this march and the flag is either an Israeli flag or like like a blank flag or something, like a sheet. It, I've seen both versions. Yeah, and it's dipped in blood and they wave it. Um, and it's also like, I mean, from the telling that I remember is that they also were like, take us back to Morocco. You know, we want to return back to Morocco. Oh, I mean that from day one yeah. of Moroccans arriving. Like they had one year where more Moroccans are leaving, were leaving than coming into the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that was that's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, and, but this whole right, like, yeah. I mean, I, I like that you were talking about this as like this myth, right? This this dream that a lot of Mizrahi were fed, which led to their migration of like, oh, you're gonna be in the promised land with other Jews. It's gonna be this utopia. 
Um, and then the rupture of that and to say like, actually it was better for us in Morocco or in Baghdad. How could that be? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then also, yeah, I mean, obviously depending on where Mizrahim are from, like for, but for many, like not having the option to return back. Mm -hmm. Right. So. That's something that infuriated, that has always infuriate, infuriated uh, Ruven Abergel. He's like, they massacred you in Europe and two days later you can go back there. Yeah. It's like, Germany was completely open to people like very quickly after World War II and the Holocaust. Like, why can't I go back to like all my countries? I mean, Morocco is like this exception, right? But like, why can't I go back to Syria or to Iraq or to Egypt or, you know, any of these? Right. And actually Morocco, now, more, you know, yeah. complicated history of Morocco-Israel relations, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Panthers are kind of, you know, they're not the first ones to really challenge, right? I mean, it seems like Mizrahim all over are finding different ways to really see, understand what was happening to them and, and to resist that in some ways. But um, the Panthers, right, as you said, are particular to Jerusalem, to Musara. So tell us a little bit about um, the stories of the founders of the Panthers. Yeah, yeah. Um... And I know you interviewed many of them, but so yeah, I mean, you mean you want like the like the stories of well, of what they did as Panthers? Yeah, because I mean, the book details it, a lot of that, like right, the meetings that they had, how they found the name, like I, I mean, whatever you want to share. I know that's it's a lot of details, but just like to give a bit more into um, what did it mean to like right claim being a Black Panther in Jerusalem, and what was yeah. the with that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I open the book with the famous story of Operation Milk. Um, and, you know, a year into the Panthers, they come up with this idea. Um, at the time, if you're rich in Israel, not even rich, if you're like well off, you know, uh, you would get milk freshly delivered to your door in the morning. Like the milkman would come, leave bottles there, uh, these glass bottles that you'd have to return at the end of the day or the next day. And um, and if you're poor, like you just didn't get that, uh, you couldn't afford to. So they went out to Rehavia one day at like 4 a.m. Uh, Rehavia is like the, one of the wealthier neighborhoods in Jerusalem. And they like steal all the bottles that are on the doorsteps. And they leave the little notes saying, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your contribution to the war on poverty and for your support for the Panthers. And we're so sorry that your poor kittens won't get milk today. <laughs> Um, and then they go, they drive across town to a neighborhood with like the funniest name, Asbestonim. Like the neighborhood is named after these asbestos sheets that they use to build the houses. Like that's how shitty the houses are. <laughs> that the whole neighborhood is like named after these like shitty asbestos sheets, which of course are like toxic and you should not be using them like for human habitation in this way. Um, and they, they put the bottles there and they're like, here you go. Uh, you know, the, the Panthers are, are uh, glad we're able to, to give you these, these bottles this morning and please enjoy them, but don't expect this tomorrow. If, if you want milk, you join, join our struggle. Um, yeah, so that was like this thing. Of course, the press covered it uh, extensively and uh, it became like an Israeli legend. If anyone knows anything about the Panthers, they probably know that story. Uh, you know, other examples is uh, you know, writing the Haggadah, right? So the Panthers are very secular. They were very, they came from very traditional observant Jewish homes. So they knew all the traditions and the rituals and the prayers. Um, but they were, as I mentioned, this is the era of, of hippies and radicals and, and, and communists and Maoists and Marxists. And, and that is the kind of influence that they borrow from. Of course, the American Black Panthers are Marxists. And, and atheists. Um, and so they um, are mostly like, they don't talk about God. It, what they do do is they decide to write their own version of the Gada, And they cast themselves as, as, as Moses, as the people delivering B'nai Israel. And they cast Golda Meir, who was the prime minister at the time, as Pharaoh. Um, and I think of this Gada that they wrote as a, a sequel to the original Gada, not even as its own version, as a sequel. Because in the original, right, the, the 
the, the Jews or the Hebrews are in Egypt and uh, they're slaves and they escape to freedom and they go to, to the promised land, right? But what happens there? Right. What happens there? And in this modern retelling, it's not so good. Yeah. Um, it's not so good. And it flips the script on like, where, uh, where is exile and where is the promised land? And, and, um, and that way it's, it's very, very smart and very interesting. And, uh, they do, you know, they also just are in the streets protesting a lot, which ends up in like these fight, these street fights with police, um, where the police like shoot water cannons at them. Um, and, and they're just like throwing stuff back at them. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. it's... <laughs> and, and, you know, they were also imprisoned Yeah, for, you know, yeah, they're imprisoned and, and, you know, always charged with crimes in and out of prison. Um, yeah. Well, so I want to actually talk about Golda Meir because she comes up a lot, right, um, as being the prime minister. But something I thought was really sharp um, as how you framed it, right, because Golda Meir was actually very aware, of, especially of American social justice issues and was seemingly seen as very progressive. And even till now, you know, there was the most recent film that came out about Golda Meir as this like heroic, liberal, like, you know, ideology that she was holding um but you know from the panthers perspective from Mizrahi perspective like i really like seeing like kind of framing her as a pharaoh right because that's who she was to them mm -hmm. so yeah i'm wondering if you could touch base a little bit about golda meir and her character as like on the one hand like being seen as this right the first woman prime minister being all about equality but then somehow that doesn't actually apply to Mizrahi. Yeah, ironic. Arabs, really. Yeah, ironically, I'm kind. Part of me is on like Team Golda. Oh no. <laughs> Let me explain. Let me explain. Okay. She is known as. Uh, I think now she's her her reputation is getting, getting rehabilitated a little bit with this movie, but like she's considered a total failure. Um, and that's how I always learn the story of Golda Meir, not because of the stuff with the Panthers, like because of like the 1973 war, right? She was prime minister when Israel was invaded and like nearly, uh, you know, defeated by, by the Arab armies. Um, and that's, that's pretty bad, like if you're prime minister. Uh, but I, when I read the history, like, I don't think it's her fault. Mm -hmm. So she was never, she did everything except for the military stuff, like in her background, right? She had these famous men who were generals, Moshe Dayan and these guys, who were like, no, no, we got this. We know what we're doing. And they and she asked them, oh, do we need to worry about the war? And she, they're like, no, no, no. Moshe Dayan, all these are telling her no. What is she supposed to like tell them they're wrong? Like, no, that's not, that's not her expertise. Um, so they fucked up. She gets blamed. She, of course, she gets blamed. She's the prime minister. The buck stops with her. But like that failure... Like erased everything she had done, and uh, and now let's set aside for a second the Mizrahi thing and the Palestinian issue. Which these are big issues. These are big issues. But just look at her as like her resume. She was an absolute force. Like she built state institutions. She. Uh, she was involved in foreign policy. She, um, I mean, in 1948, Israel might have lost the war if it wasn't for Golda Meir. She went to the United States and like in one day, like fundraised everything, like a huge amount of money from American Jewry through like these speeches that she gave. And without that money, they would not, would not have been able to buy the weapons to go like and win that. And, and she was very, very involved in social welfare policy and in uh, work training and in housing and and all these realms. So she did a million things and uh, contributed more than like a lot of the men who are like then end up being heroes because they won some battle or something, right? Um, so in that sense, I'm I'm pro Golda. Like that, like this is not fair that she is like by, by in in like the Zionist mythology, she's she's not treated fairly. Mm. Um, on the other hand, like she's totally a pharaoh and a total racist. Um, against Palestinians, of course, right? She she refused to acknowledge that they exist. And and um, 
you know, said a million things that, that wouldn't be acceptable. I certainly today, whatever, I, I don't know what's acceptable and what's not, but I can certainly tell you the way she talked about Mizrahim uh, was racist and was typical to like her, her background, to her Ashkenazi establishment background. Um, so she, um, yeah, so she, right, she, she took socialism very seriously. She was born in Ukraine and in, in what is today Ukraine and, and grows up in the United States, becomes involved with the Zionist movement and in the socialist side of the Zionist movement and comes to Israel and is like very into, before it's Israel, and it's very into the labor movement and, um, easy to say she got a lot of things wrong when it comes to like progressive politics, but, um, she, she was a true believer in this idea of establishing Israel as a socialist country. Um, and here come these, these hooligans and tell her, so what, what socialism, look at us. What, what, what are you talking about with your socialism? Like you have more than half the people who like live 10 people to a room or, you know, or live in very crowded conditions. Um, and she doesn't like that at all. She, she does, she, she tries to swat them away. Well, they were also, you know, in that time protesting, creating commotion, yeah. trying to alter public discourse. And right. There was this interest in kind of repressing that. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, she 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 does something very serious that I don't think in many histories of of Israel, I, I've never seen anyone take this thing that she did as serious as I think it deserves to be taken. But before the Panthers did a single action, when they're just planning a protest, right? Police to, uh, realize they're you know they have they're spying on the Panthers from the very very beginning. They're like. Oh, they're planning protests. Let, let's let's see what we do about it. They take it to their commander, who takes it to his commander. It gets the national chief of police. It gets to the minister of police. Minister of police tells Golda Meir. She summons a meeting of her top advisors. Minister of Justice, Minister of Police, Mayor Teddy Kolek, the national police chief, some other people. And they're like discussing, and we have we have minutes from this meeting. W what do we do about this group? Like, this is very bad. This is very scary. They're gonna destabilize. Like, what if they're violent? You know, do you remember Vadi Salib? That was really bad. Like, we can't have this. What do we do? We do we give them permit to protest? Do we not give them permit to protest? And uh, you know, there's this idea that they that they should arrest them and like prevent this protest from happening. And Golda Meir like authorizes the police to do that. That's her call, that's her decision. That's how the meeting ends. Like, yeah, arrest them. Like, wait, have they committed a crime? Like what Arresting people for wanting to hold a protest. Um, that's that's a, that's a violation of your civil rights, a violation of your free speech. And nothing like that had ever happened to Jewish Israelis before. As far as I know, I've never been able to find anything like this before. As far as I know, this is the very first time that, they, that the Israeli... And, and this is what the Israeli police commander at the time, who I interviewed, told me. It's like... We went to uh, to the we applied a, a law that was on the books from British Times, an emergency law that allows us to preemptively detain people before they've done anything wrong. Today, they many Palestinians are arrested under the same law, um, an administrative detention is what they call it. But but he says we pulled that out of out of our hats. Like we, we looked and we found this like weird law. And we, and we used it for the first time, is what he said. Um, and he said to me in my interview, and he also said it back then. I found that he was, uh, so. Um, and um, before I talk about how arresting them preemptively, of course, backfires, it's also morally, legally, politically, like this is a very, very big precedent in Israeli history. Um, and I'd like, I'd like more scholars and, and, uh, and journalists to take that, that aspect of things seriously. Um, yeah. And of course, like to, to just complete the story, um, when word got out that they like 
what, what do they do? They go, the, the, the police now spend an entire day raiding little cafes and little houses all over Jerusalem to try to catch like these 15 people um, and arrest them. And, and I found for, you know, I found their names, like no one else has, you, it's impossible to find who are the 15 people who were arrested. Everyone said they were arrested that day. Everyone's memories is like, oh, I was there, I was there, I was there. Like, yeah. this was this was one of the hardest things about the book. Um, I had people telling me I was at this meeting between the this historic meeting between the the Black Panthers and Golda Meir. Right. I was there. Or well, she called them not nice. But... And then she no. called them. She called. She was talking about that meeting when she called them not nice. Right. But but there were five Panthers at the meeting, and and we have and there's a transcript of the meeting. We know exactly who was there, but like a lot of people remembered being there and, and they weren't they weren't lying to me like yeah they were they identified with the panthers so fully yeah. that that this was real to them and, and i'm not taking that away from them i'm not calling them liar that's their truth but like for my kind of book this is like though not helpful it's like the worst thing you could do like stop saying these things to me you're, like i don't yeah. have to trust anything you're telling me anymore <laughs> yeah well but you know in that meeting where afterwards she does call the Pan panthers being not nice right this and this whole I mean, that to me has also been really inspiring, right? Because then there's an organization that got formed, like Lona Ahmadi, Lona yeah. Kisla, right? Not nice about um, kind of reclaiming that as a Mizrahi person and being like, yeah, you know, I'm not nice, you know? And I think that um, that there's something, I mean, in that, that has lived on um, around, you know, in different ways of saying that. I heard someone recently saying like, oh, I want to like reclaim being barbaric, <laughs> you know, or like all these things that were kind of tossed at us. It's like, well, what's a way to kind of assert that? And um... and about that, that story, something that I'm glad, a little thing that I'm glad I was able to correct the record about in the book is Gorda, a few months after saying that nice, tried to like rehabilitate herself because like it, it was very clearly seen as like a condescending uh, gaffe of a remark. Like you should not, you know. And what she said, and then, since then, the Israeli state archive is like gonna a post like taking her side. And they said, oh no, she was not saying that about the Panthers. She was saying that about whoever threw Molotov cocktails. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not true. That's simply not true. I found the actual documentation, the full context of her remarks. Um, I was able to find that through my research. And like she was specifically talking about the Panthers she met at the meeting who had nothing to do with any Molotov cocktails. Um, they were all like under arrest by the time the Molotov cocktails were thrown. Like they were not. And so she was talking about that meeting and talking about, I met them. Those boys are not nice. It wasn't about later. She talked about the Molotov cocktails, but it was about, so, you know, that's one of those things like, that's like my, my hill I want to die on. And I don't know if everyone, I don't know how many people care about that, but I care about it. Yeah. Correcting the record. Well, okay. So one thing that I, for me, and you know, this is an experience I had when I first moved to Oakland, the inspiration that I got from the American Black Panthers is the recognition that justice and doing justice work um, really actually starts with providing needs for mm. people who have been marginalized or oppressed, right? Because you can't just come out with all this like decolonial theory and, you know, all this academic literature to communities who don't know how to read who don't have basic food you know who don't have shelter all of these different things and you know i think that there's something about the justice discourse that sometimes is like very intellectualized as opposed to remembering that like actually a lot of movements got started by just providing needs for people so that they could show up for the meeting mm -hmm. you know and i think that that there's something um really interesting there of the similarities you know in some ways this is I feel like a universal thing for for so many movements all over the world of like being like, wait, why don't we have food? Why don't we have healthcare? Why don't we have education? Why don't we have, you know, basic housing, like all these things. And from that, the justice politics kind of emerge. Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on is that um, I'm really curious about the use of the phrase that actually shows up multiple times by any means necessary. Um, and obviously, in this moment now, it's a big phrase in the Palestinian community that people use, but not just, but it's about this relationship between violence and nonviolence. Um, and I was kind of, um, yeah, really interested in the way that you use that around the history of the Panthers and even in the meetings that they had, right? There were 
some people who are more radical, like we need to fight for our rights by any means necessary, including violent ones. And some people were like, actually, that's too far. Like, um, but but more so also, right? Like, who is depicted as being violent, right? Is it the teenage kid who, you know, is homeless and is like throwing a rock, or is it right the establishment? So I guess I'm curious to hear you speak a little bit about yeah this by any means necessary and 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 how you also kind of chose to bring that up in the book in various ways yeah i mean just to start with the end of what you said the police officer that was in charge of of repressing the panthers um he was also involved he was like a foot soldier a foot like a regular cop jim paris salini also was there and and he there was almost no mizrahi struggle where his name didn't appear as being someone who who um, was in charge of suppressing it, and he was Moroccan himself, so that that's that's kind of sad. That speaks to the sad state of affairs. But um, he was known for his walkie-talkie. Mm. He would bash people's head in with his walkie-talkie. I heard that from multiple people, including himself. He talked about that. He talked to me about how he used to beat people up in Musara um, just to like establish his dominance. So any of these Panthers had a lifetime of getting beaten up by police and experiencing um, the violence that was allowed and encouraged by the state. Um, and yes, and then they, they go to have their movement and they were never anything close to the American Black Panthers in, in the sense that like they didn't have guns. Uh, American Black Panthers had an entire arsenal like they were ready to go to war um i saw you know elaine brown's book she lists like all their weapons that they had like that anti-tank missiles they had like crazy stuff <laughs> um and like the whole concept of a swat team and the police have like a swat team that was invented in order to fight panthers in los angeles like and then and then now every police department has a swat team like so um the Israeli panthers like had nothing like that. Um, they talked about being radical. They talked about by any means necessary. Um, there was a plan at one point to like kidnap and hold hostage a government minister. Uh, they didn't end up doing that because like what they wanted, they got anyway in that case. Um, and uh, and it wasn't seen as if, seen as effective. There were some like very very radical people that were part of the Panthers, some that ended up allegedly or not helping, it was never proven, uh, helping a Palestinian uh, like terrorist cell in Hebron, like that was like gonna use weapons to like kill civilians. Uh, there's another Panther who was arrested as part of a spy ring that was uh, like they're arrested as traitors because they were helping uh, Syri the Syrian regime, like spy on Israel like that was so um out of like a con out of this idea that like you know they're on the side of Soviet Union and communism and Syria was on that side and so they're like we're going to be good communists and we're going to help Syria um but most of the Panthers were not uh doing anything like that um and they spoke about by any means necessary and they talked about how they want to destroy everything. But ultimately, that's not really what they wanted. So the American Black Panthers had, they looked at white America and looked at the history of how black Americans were treated. And, and uh, they said, well, white America doesn't want us. And they're treating us like shit. Well, we don't want them either. We'll do a separate thing. We'll be separatists. We'll create, we want to create an independent and strong and thriving black community. Goodbye. Like we don't necessarily need you. Need need you. Um, Israeli Panthers were not that. They wanted to belong. Like they desperately, desperately wanted to belong. Which is part of the tragedy of it all. Yeah. Some, I mean, and we can get to this, but like about the impacts of the Panther movement in Israeli society, which is just like, do Mizrahim ever belong? <laughs> right. And that. Like, is, is that even a possibility? I mean, my, my wife did um, her graduate research. Uh, she did an ethnography on 
the Moroccan Jews who settled Dimona. And they um, like came to be part of like the national story and like lived on the margin, like and had have pretty shitty jobs and like aren't don't hold a special heroic role in Israeli history books. Um, but she found that they like reinterpreted their own story and made themselves into heroes. And they saw themselves as like pioneers and they saw themselves, like they refused to accept the narrative that was imposed on them. And they like, they crafted their own narrative and um, a narrative that gave them meaning that made them able to create like beautiful community yeah. um, and cope with like very difficult conditions especially in those days um shelly showed us is my wife's name for the record for anyone listening um you can read versions of her her research uh the whole thing hopefully will get published one day if there's some justice but <laughs> yeah well i also wanted to talk about this relationship between mizrahim and palestinians um especially in the context of the panthers right because there's a couple interesting story there i mean certainly right um the, the way that part of the Panthers actually was acknowledging and also fighting for a Palestinian state, which perhaps was like the one of the first times to happen sure. in Israeli society. So actually, yeah, you want to share a bit of Yeah, that? I mean, right, 19, uh, 1970s, almost no Israelis have uh, support the Palestinian cause, are for a Palestinian state, acknowledge anything about the Palestinian struggle, right? It's like, not like today, two-state solution. Like, no, like, these are just Arabs and like, whatever they want, they're just like, we're not gonna listen to these terrorists and um, they don't deserve anything. Um, you know, Matspen was an exception, like a few dozen like randos. Um, and, 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 you know, maybe like a professor here or there, Shayao Leibovich, and I don't know. Let's the anti-Zionist. Yeah, they had this anti-Zionist group that, that um, tried to bring the like radical new left of the global movement to Israel. And they, they were a very important influence on the Panthers, um, but a kind of a misunderstood influence. Um, yeah, so the Panthers at this phase become aside from it's been like some of the very first Israelis to look at the Palestinians and say, no, what they want actually is legitimate. They, by 1975, they sign a, they, they approve like a position that is totally in favor of a Palestinian state. Um, they're in 1973 already, they start meeting with representatives of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, which, Again, there's a terrorist organization, the Oslo Accords, where what, what, what did Israel um, accept in the Oslo Accords? That the PLO are the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people. That's 19, in the 1990s. Panthers are saying it in the 70s, in the early 70s. Um, Charlie Beaton, uh, together with two, he, he became a member of Knesset member of the parliament and he and two other members of parliament in the communist party who are who are uh, palestinian not jewish uh they go and they meet arafat in 1980 uh and this is the very very first time that a prominent that an israeli meets with arafat now there could have been an, could maybe there was an anonymous israeli before but like history doesn't know about that he's the first like known israeli to meet with uh with arafat um and the funny thing about that, about like who gets credit for being like really radical and ahead of your time and all, Uri of Neri, the, you know, is dead, big leftist in Israel, he died a few years ago. The last decades of his life, he devoted to like uh, telling his story and his legacy. And he told everyone who would listen to like how he was the first to meet Arafat and, and in his obituaries and every, in the BBC and in Reuters and all these places, like that was the headline. Uh, Uri of Neri, the first Israeli to meet Arafat. Well, I go into the archives and I read an article by Uri of Neri in 1980, two years before he met Arafat. He meets him in 82, writing, uh, Charlie Beaton meets Arafat. He's the first Israeli to meet Arafat. He's the one 
who like documented that fact. And then he goes and like lies about it later. It's just the people are, people <laughs> do these really funny things. And so it's again, another hill I'm like, I, I, I like to die on because like, I, it's just wrong and it makes me angry. Totally. Um, and uh, you know, one of, the Panthers, one of the things the Panthers do is they look at, at the growth of settlements uh, after 67 and, and into the 70s and 80s and see all this like government money going to fund the settlements. And like, what are you talking about? Like, we need the money. We're like, w w look at how we're living. Why are, you, why are you subsidizing all these people? Like, what about us? What about the slums of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa? Um, so like they have a self-interested argument yeah. for not, for being against settlements. And they have a, um, a moral and political one of, of um, we need to make peace with our neighbors. Um, Mizrahim, they, they, they use this analogy that we've heard a million times before and since that Mizrahim are a bridge to the Middle East, a bridge to Arabs. Um, we can understand them. They can understand us. Let us, let us lead the way to peace. Let us talk. Let's Let us talk. talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, one thing that also came up a, a few times, which I think is still ongoing in the current discourse around Mizrahi, is like seeing the Mizrahi struggle as like an internal issue and then seeing like Israel, Palestine as a foreign issue or like regional issue or something disconnected. Um, and, you know, I think part of what you're saying in the book is that the Panthers were very much like, why are you not looking at domestic issues and, you know, these kind of internal issues and, and putting the attention there, right? You can't just like wash over this reality. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm curious to hear you speak a little bit about that tension, right? Between the internal issues versus the more regional politics, like, are they two separate things? Are they the same thing? Like, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the regional issue was used and still is used to this day to like shut Mizrahim up. Right. They're like, oh, well, it, it's, uh, you know, we're facing scary, dangerous enemies. Stop talking about your problems because like we have to focus on the enemies, um, which is very convenient because the people saying that are like the people in position of privilege that like have all the resources. So yeah. like, yeah, of course you want the people who are asking for, resources shut up but um so that's where that's one place where like it's just tension and the panthers were absolutely not having any of that um anytime someone tried to be like no 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 no, we're not gonna do that and they made a lot of arguments um around that one is like that is a self-interested like convenient thing for you to say uh two they said that like actually because of how we're treated, um, we're, we're like a wasted resource. Like we could actually contribute to national defense or, or to diplomacy or to like making peace, to build to prosperity, like, but you're not giving us education and you're not letting our voice be heard. So um, you're not gonna be able to accomplish these like regional and international goals without us. Right. Which is and, the whole purpose of even bringing these off in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the lessons that I hope someone from any kind of politics can kind of really internalize about the book is that Israel's treatment of Mizrahim was a squandering of like an amazing, amazing human resource. Like there are all these people that could have given so much more to the world that weren't given a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's really sad. And you don't have to be a left winger to like care about that. Yeah, no, it's it's super heartbreaking. And I think actually at the end with Ruben telling his story about being able to finally burst through the Israeli constriction, holding kind of our narratives in some ways hostage and controlling them and being able to actually, I think it's when he spoke in New York at the kind of international conference around the Black Panthers, but like, um, being able to actually speak your truth to the world. I mean, I certainly resonate with that because I think for me, and that has informed so much of my work, like I, my dream as like a child growing up in Jerusalem was to just break through the Israeli constrictions of like, why can't I speak with other Arabs? Why can't I speak 
with you know international discourse around justice issues why is my narrative constantly being used and controlled um by the government by kind of the ashkenazi establishment why can i actually just speak my truth and my narrative and i think that's something that i find that a lot of mizrahim feel um is that we we yeah we rarely have the opportunity to like share our stories just in our voice you know um so I guess the last question I wanted to ask is, you know, the end of the book, you talk about how, um, and the Panthers even acknowledged it, right? This relationship between the Panthers activism and kind of leading the, the ha creating the road for the, the code and like begging and like the whole more like right wing trajectory um, that we see in the Mizrahi community, especially kind of post eighties. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just first just hear you describe that connection and just get your thoughts about that, um, this relationship between, you know, this activism that the Panthers were doing that was rooted in kind of a universalist justice approach and was, you know, attempting to also have solidarity with Palestinians, um, but right, like all of a sudden, there was a different shift that happened with the majority of the Mizrahi community. Yeah, for, for a lot of reasons, the Panthers did not have the wherewithal to sweep the Mizrahi public behind them and, and become like a major you know, uh, force, for example, in parliament or anything like that. Uh, you know, police were actively you know, co-opting, dividing, spying, like stoking suspicions among the group and, and doing all the tactics that you can think of to, to get rid of them. And the 1973 war happens and then um, Israel is driven to like the brink and then the public is just like in such a state of shock and it's, there's no one really wants to talk about uh, the issues that Panthers raised for, for a while. Um, and the Panthers just also like didn't have organizational discipline and you know just like we're sloppy we're like a lot of them used it and admitted to using like the attention they got from the panthers to get a job to like find a way to like not be poor um and like just needed a way out and didn't continue to press uh in the struggle and um but they right but so they they like but that doesn't mean that their attacks on this old order on the pie didn't have an effect. It did. It kind of freed Mizrahim to rebel, to like look elsewhere. Um, and when they started to look at what their options are, of like, where where else can we go? Um, Panthers didn't seem to offer, Talad Mizrahim didn't seem to offer like a viable alternative to power. Um, but there's this other guy who did, Menachem Begin, who founded the Likud and ends up becoming prime minister in 1977. And he, uh, he does something the Panthers just couldn't. He offers the Mizrahim a way to belong in the national story. Now you have all these people who are like, okay, no more pretending, like, We've been condescended to, we've been left out, we've been marginalized, we've been dispossessed. Like, that was real, that was wrong. We know who did it to us. He's like, here, forget all that. Forget, like, you're not just people who've been stomped upon. No, 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 that's all completely wrong. You're brothers, you're sisters, you're warriors, you're, you're the real Jews, you're the real Zionists. He has this, like, amazing, incredible speech, like, this oratorical ability to tell him, come join me. Like, I'm gonna put you front and center in this national story. Like, Mapai has it all wrong. I, he's, he talks about how when he was in the trenches of 1948 fighting to found the country, like there were Iraqi Jews to his right and left. Like, what, how dare anyone forget that? And, uh, and Mizrahim are like, Wait, this is this is our ticket. Like this is our ticket. This is our guy. 
And as you were saying before, right, the desire for belonging is so yeah. deep. And also the exhaustion. From exhaustion, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and the Likud, they had their own like grievance against the pie, right? Because they were revisionist Zionists. Mm -hmm. So they were left out too. Like they weren't given jobs either. They weren't given positions. They weren't given land. They were like fucked over. Like I, they were like a fringe, you know, political group, but they had real grievances against the government too. Yeah. And they, like there's this alliance of like, the Mizrahim, and, and they're both angry about the same enemy. And uh, and of course, Mapai keeps like shooting themselves in the foot and like saying like racist things about Mizrahim and being condescending. And like, why can't like these, uh, you know, the whole, why, why can't the riffraff, uh, like why, why can't they understand anything like that we're, we're going to be better for them? And like, they're too dumb for their own good. Like they're, they're too dumb to know what's good for them. Like, this kind of talk and and Likud's like, no, no, don't listen to these people. They're don't listen to Mapai. We will we will um acknowledge your rightful place in this country. And do they do that? That's a different question. Um, how Mizrahim fare under Likud um and, and an Israeli right, and it's a complicated story. Um the leaders of Likud were and, and remain largely Ashkenazi. If you look even at Netanyahu's current cabinet, current government, like yes, there's there's actually kind of a lot of Mizrahim in, in who are ministers, but like all the top ministers, yeah. they're Ashkenazi. Treasury, defense, you know the these people. You know maybe you want to fact check that, but um, who's who's foreign minister anyway? Um, and, and, and there's never been a Mizrahi prime minister in Israel. Um, and Mizrahim do see actually a lot of social mobility under Likud because socialism didn't manage, it, you know, the Israeli socialist system didn't manage to redistribute resources in a way that benefited Mizrahim. But a lot of Mizrahim were small business owners. And so the ultra capitalism promoted by Likud, like, did benefit, like, a big, now there's a big, big Mizrahi middle class, and there's a lot of Mizrahi rich people, too. Right. Um, so... Which a lot of the struggle started also as a class. Right? Yeah, yeah, and so, like, capitalism was, like, good for Mizrahi. Not all of them, and a lot of them right. were left behind, and there's massive socioeconomic gaps in Israel. Um, but, like, a lot of people can say genuinely and truthfully and accurately that that it was good for them. Yeah. Um they were finally given, you know, more representation in, in Knesset. Uh, so, yeah. So, to wrap up, like, with the book being published, I guess, just this month, right? Um, and we're in this current moment um, that we are in. Um, just curious to hear your thoughts of, like, what do, you, what do you want and what do you desire and what do you hope? for the book to contribute to the current discourse. Um, and yeah, like how do you see it fitting in with, you know, now this is the first time that it's written about in English, so. There's this, there's a saying in the Talmud and it came up during the time of the Panthers. Uh, and like, I, I, if I do a Hebrew translation, I, I may want to use as the title. It, it just, the translation it doesn't work well in English. Um, uh, and which you would translate for for and and what I, what that means is like um beware the the, the children of, of poor folk because from them true Torah will will emerge um you know and that's a very rough French translation I may be missing you know like I'm I'm not a Talmudic scholar in any way and I may be missing some nuance here but that's like the idea um and it's a beautiful idea, and it's a reminder that uh, the like truth and progress or or ideals or whatever it is you believe in like can can come from very unexpected places, and that for me is a reason to stay optimistic because we we don't no one no one thought these like this collection of like street thugs was going to become pan the Panthers and change the country. Um, but they did, and there are other people who are gonna rise up 
from unexpected places and like make historic contributions that we'll all, only be able to understand in retrospect. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you want to talk about? Yeah, I think, I think I, I'm, I, I thought you would ask this about, and maybe you should edit this back in. So it's not like coming from me, but, um, I think gender is a very oh yeah I forgot the a very thing. very big thing <laughs> that like um, that I was struggling with from the beginning. Um, the people who started the Panthers were uh, were young men. Like that's how the social group was organized. Like and they were friends and they decided to be Panthers. Okay, but once they start it, many women do get involved their their girlfriends their sisters other just women in in the community um a lot of women from the united states and europe get involved uh which is an interesting there's an interesting dynamic between the the, the like these young sexy mizrahi men who are like saying like, like every they they were publicly very very sexy like they were handsome they were bad boys right like they were uh they were photographed in these ways that like amplified these things about them. And, yeah, the photographs are beautiful. Yeah, and then there's all these like, right, and and, and the Mizrahi women, the young Mizrahi women weren't like available to them because they were like relegated to more traditional rooms in the home. So they have, uh, but then they have all these like young American and European women coming to visit and they're, there's like this mutual attraction and like these love affairs and 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 marriages today. That that, be a whole book. <laughs> yeah, like, like really interesting, juicy stuff and um. Uh, so the, the women get involved, and but also women get involved in the protests. They get and and they get involved. You know, you ask this question about uh, providing needs of people. So this is a lot of work that is that was not documented, is invisibilized. Like the meals that were cooked, the prison support, right? All these panthers are in prison all the time. People bring them cigarettes and meals. You know, you, apparently you could bring home like warm cooked food to people in prison at the time, and they did that. Um, Sadia Moxiano's mom was like a huge horse, like that kept them fed and kept them going. Um, Mazal Sa'il was was this activist who was like an absolute force, just fought with the police. I have a picture of her, like no one else has seen a picture of this woman before. Um, I mean, there's a she appeared in a documentary, but like I found this photo of like her, like I heard I heard about her, I heard about her so much, um, and she's mostly known. As the wife of like the guy who like disappeared, Danny Sayl like disappeared in Europe, and there's this like conspiracy theorist that the theory that the Mossad assassinated him, and she tries to find what happens to him later on. But but she was like her own fighter in the days of the Panther Panthers, and uh, so I have this photo of her, and there are other women. I tried to like I tried to find a lot of them. There was um, Shulmit Sabari, a Yemenite, like a 19 year old woman, Yemenite woman at the time couldn't find her there are a lot who died um and they the press didn't interview them so i don't have that the police cared more about these like few male leaders um the panthers themselves when they kept records or when they shared stories they tended to tell their own stories of like them and other men um so like in terms of the oral history and like the passing down of, of folk tales like less of that for women so um we don't have much information yeah and i'd love i'd love to like you know th there could be more attempts there's new additional directions that maybe people can find um i think other disciplines could really help like the discipline of oral history um, and um, could help excavate like more of these stories. So I'd like there to be more work done around that. Um, well, yeah. you know, what's interesting about that is that, you know, in the current moment of like Mizrahi activism, certainly on the ground, it's largely led by women, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's actually very rare to find Mizrahi men who are coming to the protests, coming to the meetings, contributing. Like, So it's just also interesting seeing that gendered dynamic. You know, I mean, even with Ruven, right? A lot of the, the younger activists who come tend to be women, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so 
interesting because and, and also about you know what you're talking about in terms of like the love affairs and all this stuff um that certainly is a huge thing in the Mizrahi community around right um Mizrahi not dating other Mizrahim whether it's men women women men women mm -hmm. whatever queer relationship but like um right that whole kind of intermarriage is so much of how Mizrahim also lost the struggle in some ways it's just mm. right assimilating or becoming Ashkenazi or whatever it is like not kind of preserving that more I guess tribal identity um or finding resistance right which is I, I don't think unique to Mizrahim I think that's common in a lot of racialized groups um so yeah I mean there's definitely a whole that's a whole other book of just doing Mizrahim and gender <laughs> like the in the modern times but yeah um uh... Yeah, it's very true. I don't be interesting to try and explain why things are like that right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any hot takes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think when you like date someone of your own identity, you really have to also confront your that identity. And I think the state that a lot of Mizrahim are in right now, they don't necessarily want to talk about the past or how they got to where they are or you know it, it's a bit too much excavating all of it i mean certain people there's the relationship thing but there's also like the why are so many of the organizers and women oh, yeah. yeah but yeah those both okay. those issues i'd like yeah. to understand yeah, do you yeah. Have answers about no no I, I don't i don't for the record um maybe this shouldn't i don't know how i'll come off by even saying this but like i married a mizahi woman so <laughs> for the record <laughs> Totally. <laughs> oh, thank you for clearing the record. It is yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah. To stay in the community. Yeah, no, for sure. But I mean, these these dynamics are still very much alive, you know, and evolving. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Asaf. Is there thank any you. last things you want no, to say? No, this share? is this is the best. Like talking to someone who actually knows this stuff and like asking smart questions is like uh, a pleasure and uh I have a feeling this is going to be, if not the very best, one of the very best like interviews uh, I've had and I'm going to have and going to have about the book. So oh. thank you so much. Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure. And it was so lovely to have you. And thank you for all the decades of research you've done and <laughs> um, providing this scholarship. And if folks want to buy the book, it's available everywhere. No? Yeah, like Amazon, if that's not your thing, like bookshop.org or or. Anywhere you get books. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful.